you'll forgive me, brothers and sisters, just a moment. From the moment, the conclusion of the first reading, that last line, God calls out. And he says, who am I to send? And the prophet, who had been scared to death, scared to death, just a moment before, who's been touched by the blazing coal from the altar of God, the symbol of the Spirit, he's filled with insane zeal. And he answers, the Almighty God the creator of heaven and earth and the universe and all that it contains. He makes so bold as to say, here am I, send me. And it touches that part of me that's been ontologically changed. And it convicts me. And you listen to the second reading and you hear Paul sum up his fallenness and his failures so perfectly. And he says, and finally, he appeared to me, the least of all, one born abnormally. Paul is responsible to some extent for the murder of a saint. And he says, and Jesus Christ came to me. And he changed me. And now I preach to you the very good news I myself received. And then I have to choke out the words of the gospel. Simon Peter, trying so hard on his own can do literally nothing. And Jesus Christ has gotten into his boat. Peter might have only been listening with half an ear. And then the voice of God, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, speaks directly to him and gives an order. And he doesn't deny the order. He just kind of makes the point, maybe I might know a little something more than you about this. And he pulls up more fish than he can possibly handle on his own. One minute, a complete failure. The next, a great success. would fail if there weren't other brothers nearby to help him carry the load. And then there are those words. Can you imagine how embarrassed? Can you imagine the sudden movement of the heart? beyond any description. And he throws himself down in his own boat, on his own knees. And he looks at the one who loves him most, and he says, you can leave me, please. I have no business being in your company. The seraphim, the burning ones, that's what the name means in the first reading, the highest of the angels. They cover their eyes with their wings when they stand in the presence of God Almighty himself and they proclaim holy, holy, holy. There is no superlative in Hebrew. That's their way of saying greatest.
Peter has no wings with which to cover his eyes. He's just a man. He's just a human being like you and me. What does the Savior say? Mercy incarnate, become man. Says to him, you know, don't be afraid. What a thing for divine power to say. He says, you see all these fish. The same one who says, God knows each and every sparrow on this planet and when it falls to the ground. How much more above sparrows is a man or a woman? He says, do you see all these fish? How much more valuable are people than fish? He says, you'll be getting them. You who have no business doing this job, I've chosen you. I've chosen you. What would you do? Can you imagine leaving everything today at the end of this Mass? You go home, you have to put your affairs in order, you sell your houses and your cars and all your possessions. Put those resources at the disposal of those you trust and you put on sackcloth and you go and you do his will like a prophet. He never forces anyone. And most of our immediate instincts are to get away from it. Oh, Lord God, I am unclean. Amongst an unclean people, we're so broken, we're so fallen. If the name of Jesus Christ is ever on our lips, how often times is it breathed as a curse or just dropped flatly without thought power that's in that name has brought nations to their knees, not in subjugation, but in homage. It is the vocation of every Christian to be touched by the divine. A red hot coal comes from the altar for you and for me, and it goes down and it touches your lips. And the angels say, do not be afraid. And all they do is echo the words of your master, don't be afraid. Why would you be afraid? You'd be afraid because you're ashamed, and you'd be ashamed because you don't understand And you don't understand because you don't know. It twists me, the weight of the priesthood, how desperate this whole enterprise seems to be. I cannot give what I do not have, and so I beg because I am a beggar. Please believe me, this wasn't my first choice in line of work. And at the end of my early toils, I found my hands were dirtier than I would have dared imagine they ever could have become. And he still wanted me. So what are you to do when you meet him? <laughs> he traps Peter. Peter's in a boat. Peter can't get out. He asks him to leave. 
Perhaps he already suspected he could walk on water too. But what are we to do? Because what he's been saying to the ancients, he says to you and to me. My brothers and sisters, he does not want half of your heart. He wants the whole thing. He comes to earth. He dies on a cross. He rises again and ascends gloriously triumphant into heaven. And he doesn't abandon us. He stays right there. He's, he's right behind me. The one who loves me most. Every day I try to die a little more to what I am so that there is room for his life in me. I try to put to the torch and to the embers of the Holy Spirit those impure parts of my very soul so that I might reflect just the tiniest bit more of his glory and his kindness and his love and his mercy. Because that's the job he asked me to do. I put on this chasuble, I put on priestly vestments so that I might disappear and it might only be him. And though I be the least among you, it's so strange that he gives me this incredible responsibility to you. But I'll tell you something else I've learned in all my years. I trust him. I trust him. Whatever little strength and little understanding and knowledge I have on my own, I know is nothing in comparison to his plans and his understanding. And that takes away my shame and it takes away my fear and I start to move. My words cease being mine and my thoughts cease being mine. And yet it's still me. He doesn't delete me. He's changing us. And the more of yourself you give to him, the more you start to wring yourself out. The more you will find yourself free. And there will be pain. Pain like nails through your body into wood. Pain like a coal pressed up against your lips. And oh, the worst pain in the world, the sufferings of the human heart. Torment beyond the abilities of mortal tongue to tell, and yet every man and woman suffers it at some point in their life. And yet not to the extent that Jesus Christ did or his blessed mother. Your vocation, though, is holiness. You are called at baptismal fonts. And the mission you were given is to give glory to his name and to bring a great catch into his boat. I will try to do this job by myself. And yet, what does it say? He says other boats had to come. Other hands had to help. There was James and John and the men in their boats. There are other priests, both here at this parish, throughout the diocese, throughout the church on earth, and the church triumphant in heaven. And yes, even the poor souls in purgatory for it is hard work and labor, and God help us. And yet there were other hands in that boat too.
there is you. To be a Christian is to be radically changed, brothers and sisters, radically. It is to know you touch the supernatural and through it, you become supernatural. It is to not be surprised when you start hearing words you've never heard before. I told a story at daily mass. I'll tell it here, too. I met a man at a function the other day. And while he was sick and suffering from the recent pandemic, which was strange because he's a young man in good health, he heard a word he had never heard before spoken into his mind. You walk by this man all the time, you would have no idea. He had no idea what the word meant. So he simply turned himself over in prayer. Seemed like a Native American word or something like that. The very next day, his brother sent him a text message. There had been a shooting in a neighborhood, and that neighborhood's name was the Native American word that had just slid into his head that he had never heard or had any frame of reference to, and he certainly hadn't heard the news. You will see things. You will hear things. You will be challenged to do incredible things. He's calling to us. And he says also, first and foremost, don't be afraid. There is a reality far deeper than the superficial one the enemy wishes to trap you at. And it's real, and it's good, and you might have to suffer a little. But there's glory and power and triumph and love beyond description. The number of homeless people in this city has expanded exponentially since I was a child. Exponentially. Something is really wrong with our society. Something is incredibly wrong. That there are now so many homeless on the streets. The spread of mental illness among them is rampant, like a physical virus. And the enemy tells us the lie. Don't touch them. Treat them as lepers. They only want your money. They're only going to spend it on booze. They'll only make you miserable. You can't really help them. I will tell you another story. Another individual I know walking out of a Walmart. And she was passing a poor man and her heart was moved with pity, and she got him a sandwich. And he stuttered out a broken thank you. And as she was walking by, she stopped and she turned around. She asked, what's your name? And she talked to this homeless man for 45 minutes. And at the end of the conversation, she said, this is the first conversation I've had with another human being in a year. People just drive by or scream at me. Food is good. Kindness is good. Better than all of that, love, human contact. Caveat. <laughs> know yourself. Know your situation, always everything in prudence. Perhaps it's not the best thing to just speak to the poor if they are apparently crazy. 
But where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst of them, and there is security. Oh, my brothers in Christ, may I speak just to the men. It's the women whose heart moves, and they put themselves in such radical danger, and we draw away when it is our duty to protect them. Will you be unmanned by the ladies, my brothers? Or will you be willing to approach the poor too? Again, everything in prudence, but truly in charity as well. We are Christians. We are disciples of the God-man who purifies, who lifts up, who says, go, proclaim, whom should I send? And does your heart not move? Don't you want to say, send me? And if you don't, don't you want to weep from fear or shame? And if you don't feel it yet, oh, come and touch this fire and beg for grace. I don't care what you've done or where you've been or who you are or how old or how young. I really don't. David was 16 when he picked up a stone and slew the Philistine. It doesn't take much. Come follow me. When they got to shore, they abandoned all the worldly wealth that was this great catch of fish. And they went after true glory, and they followed the fire that is God. He'll be here very shortly. He'll come and he'll touch your lips. Let him purify you. Ask him, what do you want? And then do, as the good mother tells us, whatever he tells you. God bless you this morning.